Hello, I'm Rick O'Shea and I'm the literary curator for this year's UCD Festival. I want to welcome you to this very special edition. This year's festival is called UCD Festival at Home and is a chance for the global UCD community to virtually come together in these unusual times and join us on your smartphone, smart TV or laptop for this free event. We're also very happy to be expanding our digital and worldwide festival audience. Although the annual UCD Festival has had to move online this year, the inspiring, engaging and informative activities of the regular festival remain. It's wonderful to have the global UCD community of students, alumni, future students and friends join us for this virtual conversation and for the events at the UCD Festival at Home. Stay up to date on the full UCD Festival at Home program at ucd.ie forward slash festival. I hope you enjoy. And welcome to this event as part of the UCD Festival at Home for 2020. My name is Rick O'Shea. I'm the curator of the Literary Strand at the festival this year, and I'm also thrilled to be presenting this particular event today. It uh, was supposed to be about an event that would be out and in the real world and an exhibition that will be up and running at this stage. It will happen. It's just a question of when. The exhibition is in the Museum of Literature Ireland, Molly on St. Stephen's Green, in Dublin. Uh, it's entitled Somebody, Nuda O'Freilon and a Book That Changed Us. And the curator of that event is June Caldwell, author, and she's with me. June, how are you? Hello, Rick, how are you? Um, strange and different, but sure, that's the nature of how we do all of these things um, these days. I'm going to start and scroll back at the very beginning if I can, maybe for those people who have no sense of who Nuala O'Foylan was, maybe just tell us a little bit about her first to begin with. Well, at the time that the book was written, she was a columnist mainly for the Irish Times and a, and a freelance journalist. Um, now, she would have thought she was living quite a quiet life, but people did know her and know of her um, in Irish in Irish broadcast life and in Irish social life and in journalism. So, yeah, so Nuala grew up in the no North Dublin. Um, she left Ireland quite early in her mid-twenties. She left for London, she pursued a career in the BBC as, as a producer and broadcaster, and then she came back to Ireland when she was about 40 years of age and um, began writing, really, kind of accidentally for the Irish Times. So people would have known her as a columnist at that time, primarily. The, the exhibition and most of it is based around Are You Somebody, based around her book. So tell us a little bit about how that came together and then the, the moment when that was was published and was you know unleashed on an unsuspecting Irish world at the time. Yeah well the book had had such a bombastic effect um, when it was published in 1996 like everybody remembers this book nobody had written a memoir like it never mind a woman writing a memoir like it it was brave it was frank it was shocking it was emotional um, it had various different strands of writing in it. Like she wrote basically about her, her family, about her life lived as a woman at the time, growing up in the 50s and 60s. Um, she was born in 1940. And she also wrote about her career, how she, how she kind of got by in a man's world at the time. And then she wrote about her pursuit of passion, the relationships that she'd had that were quite clandestine. Um, I suppose, and then also about Bohemian Dublin of the time. Really, she had lived about four or five different types of a life inside one life, and it was far from conventional, though at the end of the day, she had always kind of yearned for a conventional love story as well alongside of that. And the book is kind of a lament also as to how and why that didn't happen. So there's various strands to the memoir, but it, it was just so different when it came out, when it was published and there was nothing like it and it, it, people really were they had such an appetite for it it also because she had was was so incredibly honest in how she wrote about her life it began a process of other people almost confessing they they started writing to nula um she got, received thousands of letters from all over the world and she responded to every single one of those letters and there's a wonderful archive of those letters in the National Library, which really trace and track the response to the book at the time. So it's a book that caused such a crazy effect at the time and then went on to still be relevant today. I mean, I never stop hearing about this book. Everybody still finds, finds it quite relevant. Um, young women find it relevant now. As a memoir, it's just gone down in history as unique 
And it's really about looking at that text and examining the text and the effect of that text on people at the time. And, you know, looking back and looking forward from there. So I really wanted the exhibition to be about the work rather than Newell's life or that Newell's life is just as interesting. I wanted to really look at this text and, and see and examine the effect that it had. Although, although absolutely, and maybe b before we get into the, the exhibition uh, itself, you're right, the life that she lived was a fairly unique one and, and how she ultimately ended up then expressing that was also fairly unique as well. Yeah, it was. I mean, Nuala would have considered herself quite a damaged person. Um, for any outsiders looking in at her, we, we all considered her hugely, highly achieved, extremely intellectual, uh, very able, almost frighteningly brilliant, but she would have had a, a real lack of confidence in her own self. And she related and traced this back to her background and her early life, basically kind of analysing it in the book as she went along and saying that she never really got over her early life and the trauma of it. She had quite unusual living circumstances. I suppose her father, Terry O'Sullivan, was very well known. He was one of Ireland's first kind of celebrity figures. Um, he was a columnist. He travelled all around Ireland. Um, he lived in the high life. He had a big, fancy, swanky car coming to collect him from the house every day, bringing him all over the place to high-end parties and political events and sporting events and all of that. And he reported and wrote on that. And meanwhile, the family were, were living a, a poverty-stricken life back in the house. Nuala's mother had to bring up the kids alone. They had very little money. And Nuala remembers quite a tough time growing up and the effect that this had on her. Her mother was quite unhappy, drank a lot, um, was seemingly neglected by her husband and by proxy then neglected them. So it, it's about the legacy of that kind of a background and the legacy of an alcoholic background as well, which is very important. On a life that she went on to live very, very successfully, as far as everyone else was concerned, but that she still felt that there was this hole in her life, that there was something missing and that she wasn't really entitled to feel the same level of love and passion as somebody who wasn't affected by that kind of a background. So there's a big anomaly there. And really, I think the beauty of the writing in the book is that Nuala herself, so raw emotions, like just bombastically squeezed against this high intellect. And you have this nucleus, these nuclear sentences where you have a wounded child kind of mixing in with somebody who's extremely intellectual and very brilliant as a writer and you have those two things going on together and I think that's very hard to do so you get that when you read the sentences even on a sentence by sentence basis this book is actually amazing. Is it fair to say do you think that uh, it changed the idea of what an Irish memoir could be at the time or certainly an Irish memoir written by a woman? Absolutely um, for a start it was full of shocking detail I mean Nuala talked about everything she didn't she didn't self-censor whatsoever you know or you know we'd never read or heard a woman talking about the loneliness of love and you know masturbation in a, in a hotel in Paris on her own and you know affairs with married men or her relationship with a woman and um, the, the kind of letdowns that she had suffered in love and at the same time um, She's also exposing a lot of Irish life that people really weren't, people knew was there, but they weren't really talking about it. She kind of exposes everything through the prism of her own life and her own experiences. And nobody had done that before, really nobody had done that. I mean, an awful lot of memoirs were written in the classical retrospective way up until this point. Nuala is taking a moment in time and then, and then just tearing open the society, the society in that time as she's writing about it and then revealing so much personal detail that it's it's a, a natural page turner but it's also quite shocking and sad and very very revealing it's a brilliant work of sociological kind of um historical insight as well of course and i think that's what made it so different the book comes out in in 1996 which we might like to think is is relatively modern Ireland. However, at the time, it must have been like just lobbing a hand grenade. It was, I remember. I, I had just come back from um, London from living away for seven years. And um, yeah, I remember the effect everybody was talking about it. And everybody was reading it, whether it was, you know, from um, people in my age group and in my 20s at the time, in their 30s, to grandmothers, to 
wives of men who were the exact type of men Noodle was writing about in the book, who were aghast that she was writing about the reality of, of how men were living their lives with impunity. Um, yeah, and I remember there was an awful lot of talk. And of course, she made an appearance on The Late Late Show and Gabe Byrne very cleverly kind of asks her about the book and then suggests, you know, Nuala, you had quite a lot of lovers. And Nuala kind of answered him in such a classic way and said, yes, that might be true, you know, but there was lots of reasons why I had so many lovers. Part of it might have been just for the exercise, but I, I loved very few people. And I think that was, people were just stunned then. They were like, okay, let's go out and get this book. I think it sold out in the first week. They had to run and do a crazy print run of over 40,000, which is unheard of for an Irish book, even today. And then of course, as soon as the book did well and um, it reached America, then it just went it just went sky high and was on the New York best New York Times bestseller list for over a year, I think over a year and a half. So yeah, it just it was such a surprise at the time. You knew her yourself though for for a long time. Uh, how did that come about? I was doing um, a postgrad in journalism in DIT back in 96 to 97 and Nuala's book had just come out. Nuala was in the post PR Ferrari with the book and I sent her a little postcard to the Irish Times saying, would it be possible for a student journalist to come and interview you? And I didn't expect to hear back from Nuala at all. It transpired, I later found out that Nuala always replied to absolutely every single person that wrote to her after the book and that includes thousands and thousands of people. Um, which is incredible, really. Who else does that? But yeah, so she wrote back within a couple of days and she said, journalism, are you crazy? You know, um, don't be so ridiculous. But anyway, yes, you can come and interview me. So I went along to her house. I was very, very nervous. I was in awe of her. I'd read the book two or three times. I couldn't believe I was heading along to her gaff on a Sunday morning. And I stopped off in a little delicatessen in Manila and, and got some nice stuff. And um, it was so funny because when... Later on, when I was interviewing her, she said to me in her kitchen, you know, well, you look like you're you're broken, you live in a bed, so I take that stuff home with you. You look a lot, more, you look in a much worse state than me, um, polite as ever. So I arrived at the door and her flatmate, Luke Dodd, um, said to me, she's not in good fettle, she's in a really bad mood. And I was like, oh my God, you know. And she came down the stairs with a towel wrapped around her head and um, she was just blathering she had been you could see there were tears in her eyes whatever was up she had an argument with somebody she was flustered and um, we went into her kitchen she started frying sausages straight away she was trying to feed me I didn't have the balls to tell her that I was a vegetarian I was sitting there in panic <laughs> going how am I going to tell her I can't eat these sausages um yeah so it took a while for the interview to get going probably about 40 minutes and then we relaxed into it but it was incredible the amount of information that she so generously gave me and, and really private, private details, like even beyond what was in the book at the time, I was just stunned. And she did say to me, you know, you can use this to, to write up a very good feature on your course, but just don't use it in, in the public domain. And it's so ironic that some of those details from that interview, I ended up using in an obituary um, of Nuala in for The Guardian. And it's also some of those details are in the introduction to the 10th anniversary edition of Are You Somebody, which is ironic if you look back and think I was just a little baby journalist. But um, it really did. I found it quite life-changing. First of all, as well, she said to me, don't go into journalism. You need balls of leather. You just don't have it. You're too sensitive. You're like me. I can tell you're going to be rubbish. She, she was right. She thought I should have been a writer, a fiction writer. So that really hurt my feelings at the time because I was so determined to become this journalist. Um, and she was right. But she was very, very insightful. And she'd no filter. Nuala would just tell you the truth. And you had to take that and handle it. And sometimes that could be quite hurtful. She was very, very brutal, as well as being very, very brilliant. But always, always generous with her time. To and then she kept in touch. She arrived up about three weeks later, unannounced, to my flat in Ballsbridge. I was living in a bed sitting in Ballsbridge at the time. And she arrived up with a cat in a basket and... 30 quid and said the cat needs a hysterectomy but I thought that you could do with some company and uh, yeah and then I drank drank the hysterectomy money and bought some fresh pasta and a bottle of Bacardi so had to come clean to her that the cat ended up pregnant and I ended up living in that bed sit with about six kittens at the time and um, she never forgave me for that but anyway yes so we kept in touch after that point on email for 10 years 10 or 12 years yeah there comes a point then, obviously, where you, you, this exhibition, where you're, you're, you're approached to curate this and, and put this together, and it's it's a huge volume of work that has to go into something like this. 
how did that come about? Was it your idea initially? Were you, were you approached? Were you nervous about the idea of attempting something like this? Yeah, si- Simon O'Connor, who's absolutely brilliant, the director of Molly, he rang me up and I did. I tried to talk him out of it. I was like, look, I only had a very loose connection with Nuala. Maybe you need to go and talk to somebody um, a bit more academic or whatever, or an archivist or somebody who's used to doing this type of work. Um, and then he said, no, you know, I read your introduction. I wrote the introduction to a 10-year anniversary edition of the book after her death. And he said, no, I read the introduction and I'd like you to do it because I want you to, to discuss the relevancy of the book today and let's see where we go with it. And I thought about it. I thought, what can I do to make this exhibition different? Because, you know, there have been um, two or three documentaries on Nuala's life. And then I thought to myself, I still hear about this book constantly from all kinds of people. And they're, they're possibly not people always in the public eye. And, and the influence of this book, sometimes it can be very small influence. Sometimes it's, it's a big influence. There's a whole web of people out there that are connected to this book. And let's just get into that web and see how people, how it affected people. Um, and not necessarily expert voices, but there are expert voices in there as well. So I wanted to include... Some, some family members, um, some friends of Nuala who knew her well, and then just people who didn't know her but were influenced by the text, and let's see how that text had an impact on their life. So that's what I did. And I began to ring around and put a list together of people that I wanted to interview. Yeah, and I, I've seen huge tracts of those interviews. I've seen an hour and three quarters worth of, of, of those interviews, and they're incredibly broad in terms of who you, you ended up speaking to. How, how, do you, how do you start that process in terms of, you know, having, trying to put a structure on it, trying to figure out who you need to talk to, who you approach, are there documents you need to look at? That's the, because on day one of doing something like this, you pretty much start with a blank page. Yeah, I did start with a blank page, and funny enough, you know, Every time I spoke to somebody or considered somebody, they gave me a lead to it to something else. For instance, when I contacted Evelyn Conlon, um, she told me that Nuala had done a, a, a course at the at the Irish Writers Centre when she was trying to write the memoir, and I'd heard that before. I couldn't find out who had taught her, and Evelyn said it was Mary Mary O'Donnell. So then I contacted Mary O'Donnell to take part. So it was just a web that began to open out and reach out to other people through through the information that I was receiving. And also, I wanted some really loose connections. I wanted to find some young people today that had maybe only read the book recently and, and, and found it still relevant, because I still think that it is. And I wanted to kind of trace that road of where women like Nuala, who were involved in the women's movement and in the feminist project, had kind of laid down those paving stones to the, on the road to repeal and, and to try and trace some of that as well. Um, and I did, I found, I found one or two readers who'd only read it in the last year by sheer coincidence. So I, I just began putting all this information together and then took part and just asked these people to come in and do the interviews. And then from there, we, we used that information. It was spooky how good it worked, though, the people that we did end up getting. There was nobody that was, you know, everybody had something, had new eyes on this work. And even her friends who knew her at the time, they'd new eyes on her work. In, in the 12 year gap since she's last been around, you know, they have they have kind of further insight on what the work now means, given what's happened in the world since Nuala left it. So that was even interesting. And one of the most interesting aspects of doing all of this is the archive in the National Library of the people who wrote to Nuala. It's absolutely astounding. Like they must think I'm nuts in there. I cried my lamps out every day. I went in to have a look at these boxes of letters. People were confessing the most crazy things to Nuala that I don't think anyone would do these days in this time, the time that we now live in. You know, it really did rupture something in the Irish psyche at the time that people could literally write to a total stranger with their absolute deepest, darkest secrets uh, and traumas. And some of those letters are really hard to read. And then, of course, there's lots of men writing to her, telling her how to behave now that she's famous and how to conduct herself and these kind of smarmy arguments that are going on. And then there's, of course, there's loads of, of love letters, people who've just fallen in love with her since the book got, what got published. Crazy ass love letters, in fact. So the archive itself, I mean, you could really do something with that separately to the, this entire exhibition. But we're, we're including an element of that in the exhibition in the form of a pamphlet. 
yeah, I think when you talk about the, the, the nature of the letters that men were sending or it proves that trolls were around even 25 years ago, you yourself, because you knew her, do you think that that made this act of curation easier or harder? I think it made it hard because I didn't feel justified enough. I didn't know her very well. It was a, I was a loose connection. Um, you know, I kept in touch with her on email all through the years and she'd berate me for my life choices and she'd she'd also helped me quite a lot. She was very good at giving advice and, you know, she'd no filter. So Nula was, Nula's somebody who would tell you the truth, you know, she, all the time, say, why are you doing this? Why are you moving out of Belfast to some horrible little town on the outskirts where nobody will know you and everyone will think you're half mad, you know, cop on, stay, stay in the city that has something to offer you. She'd give you plenty of life advice. Um, she did also offered to be a referee for an MA in creative writing that I did at Queen's. So that was that was great as well. And she was very, very um generous in her in her time and, and what she gave you. And she was also brutally honest as well. And you need that sometimes. But this was only like an email friendship really. So it did make it hard because I wanted to get further and deeper into her life, but I wanted to do that through the text. And that was that was a tricky thing to balance. Um, I'm sure there were better people to do this. In other words, nonsense. I'm, I'm, I'm. I realise it's very hard when people are maybe watching this and seeing you and I talk about an exhibition that physically isn't in the real world as yeah. of yet, and they haven't seen any of this. So what I've done is we've taken three very short clips of some of the interviews that you've done, just so we can have a quick look at them here. And maybe have a have a chat about them afterwards. The first of them here is academic and author Emily Pine. I think of that term silence, you know, that gets used about we have to break the silence or women have been silenced or women's voices have been silenced. Except we know that's not true. Like women are talking and talking and writing and writing and it's a cultural attitude that has is doing the silencing. And it's such a it's kind of such a false thing to have to battle. And then you and then you know, whether whether your work is out there or Nula's like Ophelon's work is just so brave and so loud that it's unavoidable. So as uh, Emily says there, do you think that at the time that Nula, you know, broke down, even if there were perceived barriers and, and has done so for the following 25 years? Absolutely. I think she was, number one, exposing how a lot of society was living at the time and how men uh, of a certain rank within that society were living with impunity. Um, and she did that through talking about the relationships that she had with those men. And she also gave us an insight into, into basically Bohemian Dublin and how, how the artists and writers and everybody else was living at that time under the, under the surface. And that, that kind of Bohemia was always there, but we, we never really get to hear about it. We heard about it from Joyce and the lads and whoever. But Nula's like, look, you know, here, here is that, that, slice of Irish life that was going on but really for women there wasn't an awful lot going on you were really only considered to be the girlfriend of a, of a writer you were never considered to be there was no parity with the, with the great brains of the time even if you were an artist or a writer yourself you were there as almost almost as decoration for these men so she she talked an awful lot about that and she talked about her personal history which a lot of women hadn't done up until that point and she talked about it very brutally and honestly. And you almost have to have a healthy disrespect for your own family in order to do that. And that would have convinced a lot of people not to do that. We're, we're, we're kind of bullied by that notion that you can't talk the truth inside your own family. And she just cast all that aside and said, right, well, I'm going to do it. And that did break, break a barrier. It also kind of hurt some of her family members and they've acknowledged that. Um, but it's something that Nuna felt that she had to do. So that was an important barrier broken. And really just to talk about society, what was working in that society, what wasn't working, the, the place of women, and even someone uh, as who had got as far as Nuala had in life uh, still faced momentous challenges and barriers, and she still needed a huge amount of strength in order to get past that and have a career as a journalist and as a writer. And she discusses that as well. But it's the minutiae, it's the small, tiny, web of details that she discusses from the, from ed, being educated in a convent to what that involved to clandestine love affairs to society at the time to politics to the economics in the country she it was a book that reached out to absolutely everybody and included everybody men women children and um, the entire systems at work and you see it as a whole for one of the, for the first time in in a book you see all of that system as a whole because she had such 
unique avenues in from from various different perspectives within her own life. So yeah, I think it did. I think it definitely was barrier breaking. And we know that from the response to the book. And you also spoke to uh, the novelist and the former laureate for fiction, Anne Enright. Mm. Anne was absolutely brilliant. Anne Everyone in Ireland, I ate that book. I mean, everybody read it. We couldn't believe it. It was a bit like Knausgaard in Norway. People were reading it at the bus stop saying, is this the person we meet, we see on the TV? Is it, you know, such a small society to bring out a little bomb of a book like that. Um, and the first reading was a kind of uh, intense moment of gossip making. You couldn't believe she was saying these things about her family. She was breaking. It was it was late night talk. It was the kind of thing you might hear from somebody in bed or in a, you know, in a confessional or in a pub. It was absolutely untrammeled um, and amazing. And I, and I, so it's really interesting to get a, a, a first hand take from someone like her about, about the book at the time. Absolutely. And Anne was very honest also. She spoke about how hard Nuala was on, on the mother figure in the book. Um, she felt that she'd been quite hard on her mother. And um, Anne felt uncomfortable with that. But she also talked about how that influenced her own work and writing and some of the themes in some of her books. So that was really interesting to hear. Um, you know, I could listen to Anne and write for 10 hours on the trot. That's no problem. She had such great insights. And she also spoke about how, how and why the book was shocking at the time. So Anne's interview is, is absolutely brilliant. You also spoke to a historian Dermot Ferreter as well. <laughs> I would characterise the 1990s as a decade of revelations. We were beginning to learn things about the dirty underbelly of Irish society in previous decades. It wasn't ancient history. In many respects, it was still going on. We still had this reliance on institutions. The last Magdalene Laundry was, was closed the very same decade uh, that Are You Somebody appeared. And what was interesting about it was its searing honesty, but also its tackling of taboo subjects, writing about feelings, writing about disappointment, and opening up these areas for discussion motherhood, love, ambitions, the feminist project. project. Was it uh, interesting to get a, a sense of perspective from uh, somebody who deals with Irish history about her influence of the history of the time as opposed to maybe just potentially her place in, in Irish writing at the time? Absolutely, yeah. It was, it's also a crucial part of the exhibition really to rein us back in and give us that context um, you know, he makes the point that the Magdalene Laundries are only shutting the year that you know, the last one, the year that this book was published. So you're kind of riding that crest between old Victorianism and the and the old world and all the strictures of that old world, and then this new world that was opening up. But really, there was still an awful long, uh, an awful way to go. And he talks about really at the time that Nuala was was growing up, and um, even before she worked as a journalist, women were they'd kind of disappeared at the age of 20. They either had to kind of be married off or they went into jobs and disappeared until they got married or else they were just in the home. Really, women weren't part of the public fabric of life at all. And he gives that great context um, through his interview. It's quite, it's quite shocking. And we need reminding of that. We can never be reminded enough about that. Maybe tell me what you think the legacy of the book is today. I think um, I think Yvonne Nolan puts it great in in her interview for the exhibition. She says, you know, it's it's a roadmap of of, of where you know it's it's the portrait of the artist as a young woman. It's a roadmap also of how a woman had to had to kind of plan out that life that she had without being able to plan it. How Nuala had to fight her way through and and really um, kick down all those barriers all the way along through her career against the odds because a woman at that time really couldn't get a career the way that Nuala did. Um, so I think there's so many of the interviews give very, very different perspectives on this work. And how it's still relevant is that we really haven't moved very far beyond. Whilst we have moved past, we have repeal, we have parity in jobs, there's still women who are earning less than men in the same jobs. There's still an awful lot of misogyny around, casual or otherwise. 
we still have a society that that favors favors men um, in, in in public life. We see that even in the amount of women in politics. So yeah, I mean, if you look to and look at everything that Nuda talks about, all the different topics, and and ask yourself how far have we moved on today? You could argue that we haven't moved a huge amount. There's lots has changed, but there's still lots that needs to be done, and it's just it is really it's spookily relevant and you, that that's made apparent by young people who can read this now and and are shocked that the book was written back in the 90s because they thought that they're reading it and the information to them is ringing true it's it's familiar but it's also familiar to somebody like me who grew up in the 70s i recognize that old world that Newell is talking about um the world of of, of the gray coat civil servant and the wives at home on volume freaking out and the big families that and the, the lack of contraception and the lack of choice and all of that I recognise, but so too do young people who come to this book for the first time. So really, it's also um, it's also a look at how far how far do we need to move from here and what do we need to do and how, and where can we go on and you know what's what needs to be done and that that work that's valuable. Um, yeah, so I think it's I think it's very very relevant and it's also relevant as. A work of art in its own right as a memoir like it's an astounding memoir i don't think you could get away with writing a book like this now for a start nula name drops all over the place i think you'd you'd get your ass sued these days if you did that she was still able to do that at the time a lot of the people she was writing about were still alive you cannot do that now in the world that we live in so i think it's a unique a unique take on memoir writing that just isn't isn't there for us to write like this now i mean i would see somebody like emily pine as the next generation of Nula or Sinead Gleason with constellations as, as the next generation of Nula. But nobody can actually write a book like this again. Um, and I think that's that's its unique record in, in that vein, you know? Maybe just before we finish up, I want to ask you about yourself as a curator, because obviously there is a vast amount of work that goes into compiling something like this and into putting something together that in theory would now be almost ready to, to be out in the real world and to be in the museum and people would be coming to see it because of where we are right now. That's not happening as of yet and it will happen hopefully somewhere further down the line in the summer. Is it frustrating that it's 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 not out there yet for, for people to get their teeth into it? You know, ironically it's not because it's given me time to think about what else I have to do. You know, like I'm using the archive of those responses to the book to put together a pamphlet. I'm going to try and do something modern with it. I'm going to try maybe and look at, at, at a kind of a Twitter response. If Nula was alive now and had written this book today, how would people be responding to her on Twitter? And I'm going to take some of those sentences from those letters and maybe turn them into tweets. So that that's all brewing away in my head at the moment. The interviews that we've done, it's given me an awful lot of food for thought in how we can use the information to the absolute max. Like they're, they're, it's going to be a multimedia exhibition. You will be in a room listening to interviews, listening to people's take on the text, as, as well as hopefully um, being encouraged to look at that text and go and read the book. And it's really about, it's not, it's not about bringing a book back to life because I don't think that this book is any way buried or dead. I think this book has always had a, had a huge pulse. It's still there in, in our, psyche if you like but I do think that this is going to give the book a kind of a new lease of life in a way um, and I think that's very much needed we need reminded that books like this shouldn't be put aside or cast aside and that they're still relevant so yeah whilst it didn't happen as quickly as we had planned it's given me a lot of food for thought about what we can do now and, and of course the exhibition will probably be, be um, will probably be on for longer now ironically so that, that suits as well I'm very, very pleased about it. I'm really excited about it. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see how people will respond to the information that we've managed to get. Looking back on uh, the nature of your interactions with her, uh, what effect do you think that she had on you as a mentor now in your career where you are as a, as a published writer? Yeah, I thought about this. You know, when my book of short stories came out, I actually thought of Nula. I thought that she would be disgusted by them. Ironically, she's somebody who's, who would have taught me to not self-censor, but I think that my book would have been too much for her in a way. Um, and I, I don't mean that in any kind of glib or patronizing way. I think she would have thought that I was too indiscreet 
and too raw and, and pukey in, in the way that I dealt with my short story writing. So it's kind of funny. I'm, yeah, so, but she did, she encouraged me to be open and honest and not to care about what anyone around you thinks. You can't, when, it's, when it comes to writing and it comes to art, you can't censor the self. And that's the huge thing I've taken away from knowing Nula. And also then to keep, to keep pushing, um, you know, I knew before my book came out that there was two stories in the book were, were involved quite strange sex or sexual scenarios. And I knew everybody would concentrate on that and they did. And knowing somebody like Newell, it would be like, you know, get beyond that, get past that. You're going to get really ridiculous questions as a woman and you need to be aware of that in advance. So I just have her there. Her voice is constantly there in my head. I think she was, she turned out to be an amazing mentor and somebody who was so inspiring to me that I can now take that friendship and, and bring it into the future with me and just always make sure that, you know, I, I try and do the best I can with my own writing and, and not care on that level that I'm going to hurt other people by what I choose to write about and how I choose to write. So that's fantastic, yeah. I wish she was still here though, because I can't help thinking how, how much the world has changed since she passed away the last 12 years, even America, Trump, her take on that, her take on the whole repeal situation here, on politics here, um, yeah, on, on what, what we're living through now. I mean, I, I'd love, to, I'd love to, to read a column of, written by Nuala Fuelan on the, on the pandemic and the whole politics of that. I just feel that she, we were robbed that she was taken from the world at a relatively young age of 68 because she was such an incredible brain and we, we'd still really benefit from having an, her brain around. But um, there we go. We just have to imagine what she would feel and think. And, t and take that and somehow work with it. And that's what I hope this exhibition will do. Just before we finish, um, if people haven't yet read your wonderful collection of short stories, Room Little Darker, they should. Uh, are you working on anything at the moment? Yeah, I am. I'm working on a novel. I'm actually working on a couple of short stories at the moment and then I'm getting back to finishing a novel that will hopefully be out next year. So we'll see how that goes. It's, it's not as um, ugly as the stories. I hope there's a little bit more elegance in it this time. I think I've moved on a little bit in the three years, you know, I, past that, you, you know. Is that something you're finding easier or harder in the, the situation that we all find ourselves in now? Because I've talked to a lot of authors over the last while and, and it kind of varies quite a lot of authors are finding it very hard to write at the moment. Yeah, harder. Well, it's, the strange thing is that this whole situation hasn't really changed much for me. I'm a carer. I'm at home with my mother all the time anyway. So... I'm pinned to the house as it is. I have dealt with my father's death though. He died five weeks ago in the middle of all this and, and went off into the crematorium alone as so many people have. And that was very odd, really strange experience because you're not, you're not getting to say goodbye and you're, it, it's not, um, the reality isn't hitting. If you don't, if you don't see somebody, then they're gone. Um, so I'm de dealing with all of that is, has been very, very strange. But yeah, it's no difference otherwise. I'm writing on and off. I'm probably not writing as much as I could be or should be at the moment, but that's because we're all dealing with the details on the periphery. And we're all dealing with being at home and sharing space and so on and so forth. So, yeah. And even going out to the supermarket is a hassle, isn't it? And, you know, I'm worried. I'm worried about my mom having an 86-year-old at home. I'm super paranoid about that as well. So, yeah, that does take up your mental space. And we are all having crazy dreams, are we not? So we're dealing with that and it does affect your creativity but it's it hasn't muted it or you know it hasn't cut her off completely so business as usual really it is a, a terrible shame that you and i are not doing this in a tent uh, sitting beside the lake in ucd as originally was the plan for us to do it yeah. for a first time round. but it has been brilliant nonetheless to have the conversation with you the exhibition is called somebody nula of Fuelon and a book that changed us and it is coming soon to molly museum of literature ireland and june caldwell thanks again for talking to us today thanks so much rick take care